think we're all very disturbed by her death. And no matter who pulled the trigger, I think we have to realize that the system pulled the trigger on Jane Hirschman Corkum. And we have to work very hard to change that system. I think that there are a lot of people out there, as, uh, as Jane said back in December, who, who feel that it is not taboo to beat or to abuse women, but it is taboo to speak out about violence against women. And she would not be silenced. And I think if, if we can take her spirit with us forward, we have to all realize that we're going to have to speak out too, a lot more often and a lot louder, and not be afraid to stand up. We have to capture the spirit that Jane left us um, of great courage and personal sacrifice. So will you join me for a few moments of silent reflection as we all wish together? Jane, we wish you peace. Thank you. And now Pat Baker will introduce our guest. Good evening, and I'd like to welcome you to the fourth in the Nancy Roll Jackman Chair Lecture Series this year. It's my very great pleasure this evening to introduce to you Dr. Maria Mies, Dr. Mies is a professor of sociology at the Fachhochschule in Köln, Germany. In India, where Dr. Mies lived for many years, she undertook research on problems facing urban and rural women. She has been active in the women's movement since 1969 and founded, together with other women, several feminist organizations in Germany. In 1979, she initiated the program Women in Development at the Institute of Social Studies, The Hague in Holland, and was head of this program until 1981. Dr. Mies is the author of many journal articles and several books, including Indian Women and Patriarchy, The Lace Makers of Narsapur, and Indian Women in Subsistence and Agricultural Labor. Her book, Patriarchy and Accumulation on a World Scale, is one of the most important analyses of the dependence of today's global economy on sexual and racial exploitation. Dr. Mises' political work and research cover a wide range of topics. Feminist theory and methodology, the relationship between capital accumulation, colonialism, and women's oppression, women's movements in Europe and the Third World, a critique of genetic and reproductive technologies and of patriarchal science in general, and the relationship between the ecological movement and the feminist movement. She's a member of FINRAGE, Feminist International Network of Resistance to Reproductive and Genetic Engineering. Her work is an eloquent challenge to the distinctions often made between feminist research and action, calling for, and I quote from one of her articles, the reunification of life and thought, action and knowledge, change and research. Indeed, as she has said, and I quote again, I can imagine no freedom for women without this reunification. Dr. Mises' topic this evening is the global in the local, an eco-feminist perspective, and is based within her current research on ecological issues. Dr. Mies, welcome.
I hope that I can fulfill the expectations which you have raised now. <laughs> but uh, I would like to sit here. I hope you don't mind. Uh, the title of this lecture is somewhat ambitious. The global is in the local, an eco-feminist perspective. Uh, but I think it is a title which is quite appropriate to the problems we are discussing this year, particularly uh, in respect to the so-called Earth Summit that is going to happen in Rio de Janeiro in summer this year. But if you look at the title as such, it expresses the, at the same time the division and the connectedness of two poles, namely the local and the global. Uh, this is one of the many examples which we know of the dualistic and hierarchical divisions which have structured patriarchal civilization since its beginning, and particularly capitalist patriarchy since several hundred years. These structural divisions are well known, and I just mentioned a few of them, between public and private, spirit and matter, mind and body, culture and nature, and so forth, woman and man, development and underdevelopment, transcendence and immanence, I call them colonial divisions because they are based on an exploitative relationship. They are always based on violence against women, nature, and other peoples. And they are dynamic relationships. One pole progresses, grows, evolves at the expense of the other. So it's not a static relationship. Eco-feminists have criticized these divisions since long and have set themselves the aim to overcome them and to heal the world, uh, which has been divided by these divisions. Instead of continuing with these false dichotomies, they emphasize the interconnectedness of all things, which so far have guaranteed life on Earth. All, as all colonial relations have not only one but many dimensions, so also the relationship expressed in this uh, title, the global is in the local, there are many dimensions. I will try to cover some of the most important ones in this lecture. Um, and I shall ask whether we, eco-feminists, feminists, or other people, also men, concerned with the question whether life can go on on this earth, uh, whether we are able to reweave this destructive connection in such a way that the well-being of one pole is no longer based on the exploitation and finally the destruction of the other pole, that the expression, the global is in the local, becomes an expression of hope, of joy, about the living relatedness of all things, or of the symbiosis of life, of which we are all part. So, but to begin with, I am trying to show or to see why or uh, when did this uh, combination of the local and the global come about in the context and with regard to environmental problems. 
the first dimension that comes to my mind when I think of this connection or disconnection, because we have to see that it is always both. I will explain that a little later, why it is both connected and disconnected. Uh, we are, uh, what comes to my mind first, is a growing number of reports about global catastrophes or the global consequences of what men, and to be precise, particularly men in the industrial north, or what I call white men, has done to nature. <coughs> Recently, Lester Brown, the president of the World Watch Institute, while presenting the latest report on the state of the world in 1992, confronted his audience with the alternative, either we have an ecological revolution in the next years, or it will be the end of our civilization the end of human life on our globe. These alarming words were based on the latest data about global warming, the exhaustion of non-renewable fossil resources for energy, the increasing pollution of air, water, and soil, the growing desertification and the rapidly growing destruction of the ozone layer. Already now, thousands of children in Los Angeles are suffering from chronic respiratory problems as a direct result of air pollution. Meanwhile, the information of the World Watch Institute about the shrinking of the ozone layer has been confirmed also by NASA, who found out that the ozone hole is not only growing in the area about the Antarctic and the Southern Hemisphere, but also in the Northern Hemisphere over North America and Europe. And this shrinking of the protective and delicate ozone layer in the northern hemisphere would result in 200,000 more people dying of cancer in the United States alone in the next 50 years. These are the projections uh, of the NASA. Uh, whereas some years ago, people could still feel that ecological catastrophes were local affairs which could not affect them. This is changing now. Bhopal, for instance, was bad, but it was far away in India. Or the poisoning of the River Rhine by the Sandos factory, uh, Swiss uh, 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 multinational, uh, affected the people who lived along that river, but why should people far away from that area worry? And so on. But meanwhile, it is increasingly becoming clear that ecological catastrophes cannot be contained to the area where they may happen particularly after the Chernobyl disaster, the lesson had to be learned that nuclear energy cannot be controlled, that radioactivity does not respect national or geographical borders. The destruction of the rainforest will not only endanger the lives of the people who live there, but will affect the climate everywhere and possibly is already affecting the climate here you have a lot of more snow, I heard, than in former <laughs> years. We didn't have any snow this winter, and I was in Sweden last week, and they didn't have any snow this winter. So obviously, these changes are no longer a matter of the future. Uh, the global warming, which can be felt in Europe and in other parts, the dramatic climate changes are due to CO2 two emissions which are caused to a very large extent by the millions of cars in the industrialized world of the North. So the consequences of white men in the modern industrialized countries has done to nature can no longer be externalized. They can no, no longer be pushed outside of this globe or to some other parts of this world. Obviously, this comes back to us. So this is one reason, I think, why we talk of global catastrophes. But on the other hand, also what is locally done has global effects. The closer we come to the Ecological World Summit in Rio de Janeiro this year, the more we will hear about such global ecological destructions, but also about the imminent need for global action against this ecological suicide. However, if we look at the analysis given and at the analyses given on the causes of this global threat by, for instance, the World Watch Institute and other such concerned international organizations like the Club of Rome or the Puntland Commission, 
we find a strange paradox. They all agree that one-fifth or one-fourth of the world's people who live in the affluent industrialized countries of the North are using up about 85% of the world's resources and produce about 80% of the world's waste and pollutants. But instead of drawing the logical conclusions from these data, the blame for this situation is put on women, particularly on women in the poor countries, because they are the ones who breed too many poor children. And this is a, the, the cause number one, which is mentioned, and it will again be mentioned in Rio, that overpopulation is the main cause for environmental destruction. And this overpopulation is also seen in a global context. Uh, this overpopulation uh, is not uh, found so much in the rich countries of the north, but particularly in the third world. It is said that world population is growing at a rate of three people per second or a quarter of a million people per day. This is according to the United Nations Fund for Population Action uh, faster than at any time in history. And the most rapid growth is in the developing countries. So the poor who breed too many poor are seen as the main culprits. But there is no mention usually in the reports of the United Nations or other such world watchers about the exploitative and colonial world system we are living in. No mention of the prevailing development paradigm or of the wasteful production and consumption patterns of the industrialized societies. Uh, for instance, uh, I'm the, yeah, in spite of the understanding that 80% of the world's resources are being used by about 20% of the world's population, huh? no conclusions are drawn from this. Instead, it is usually assumed that the standard of living and the lifestyle which is prevailing in the North would eventually also be uh, imitated and realized in the countries of the South. This is what I call the strategy of the catching up development. So behind many of the projections in the, into the future stands this uh, strategy of catching up. And that means it is assumed that all people living in the world will have the same standard of living, like for instance, average, uh, an average citizen of uh, Canada or of Germany or the, of the United States. Um, for instance, the UN FPA writes, as incomes grow, lifestyles and technologies will come to the resemble those of Europe, North America or Japan. There will be an increase in car ownership. Since 1950, the human population has doubled, but the car population, and they call it population also, that's very interesting, <laughs> the car population has increased seven times. The world car fleet is projected to grow from present 400 million to 700 million over the next 20 years, twice as fast as the human population. So one could ask, okay, if that is the case, then why not stop the growth of the car population instead of trying to curb the human population? Hmm? But this does not happen. Uh, one could, for instance, ask to introduce certain quotas that not more cars should be produced than are environmentally uh, bearable in a particular area or generally speaking or globally. Hmm? But this never happens. But the, all the calculations start from the assumption that the state of uh, life or the standard of living we have now would go, first of all go on. It will grow because that is the basic philosophy of our economy, that the economy must grow, that there is growth every year of the GNP. And that means more cars have to come. And on the other hand, the third world nations of the South, they will come up to that level. Now this is in my understanding, which is a lay 
woman's understanding just a stupid and impossible uh, uh, logic, because even if uh, the third world would come up to that level, or the car population in their countries would come up to the level of our car population, hmm, then our car population would have grown in the meantime again by I do not know how many hundred millions. So it's this catching up thing will never work. And of course, this is also known, I think, to many of these analysts. In any case, uh, the permanent growth of cars, fridges, other uh, durable and non-durable consumer goods at the level uh, is in the, in, the, in the north and the effort to catch up with this is a self-defeating strategy. Uh, some of the analysis, an analysts have already calculated if one would try to uh, emulate the model and generalize this model of production and consumption which prevails in the north. That means every person living uh, on earth would have the same standard of living. All the Chinese, all the Indians, all the Africans would have as many cars and as many fridges and as many holidays and so forth. Uh, then what would happen? Some have calculated that the oil reserves would be finished in 19 days. Another analyst has said it would be, uh, the oil reserves would be finished in four years, and other resources would be finished in 37 years. So we can see the catching up strategy uh, to emulate this model, or to have social justice in the world, if you like, hmm? because that is what is behind these calculations, to justify them. Uh, you cannot say, OK, we should have so many cars, but the others should not have so many cars. Uh, that this is not possible, ecologically speaking. A German trade union leader uh, once uh, reflected on this, and when he realized that all the Chinese should have as many cars as we Germans, that means every second citizen would have a car. No, that is not possible. Hmm? For ecological reasons, it is not possible. Other people said we would need several more planets uh, for raw material and other planets to dump our waste. And these are, in fact, uh, figures which are to be taken seriously because these are the problems of our societies already now, that the resources are getting scarce. Just now I heard over dinner that the fish resources are getting scarce uh, here in, at the coast of, uh, of Canada. But other resources are getting scarce. And I think the Gulf War was fought for control over resources, namely oil, which is getting scarce in the future. And if we look around, this will happen to other resources if we go on with this kind of wasteful lifestyle which prevails in the north, in the northern countries. And if we also think that this should be the right life, the good life for everybody in the world. So I think um, I will come to that point again later. Um, one question is here, the global or the calculations on global population figures, which are here, and this catching up strategy, the assumption that everybody in the world should have the same standard of living as prevails here is economically and ecologically, A, not possible, and B, it is not desirable. I will come to that point why it is not desirable later, but just for the moment I leave that these two theses, this catching up strategy is neither possible, it is an illusion to believe in it, but it is also not desirable. It is not uh, an aim, uh, we should really pursue for our society because it has not even fulfilled the promises uh, for the people living in the rich countries of the north. Of this, I will come back to that point later.
So the next, the next point I want to talk about is the global is in the local. Uh, why is it that we talk about global dimensions now and what is really behind this all? Is it just a kind of playing around with words or is there any reality behind these two poles we are talking about? There is, uh, thank you, uh, another dimension of the global local dichotomy which is usually not seen by those who emphasize global ecological deterioration. It is usually also not addressed to by postmodern critics of cultural and ideological universalism or by leftists who criticize this globalization because of its inherent inegalitarianism. This dimension is hidden within the commodities which most of us consume every day. The food we eat, the clothes we wear, the cars we drive, the houses we live in. Yeah, if, uh, it's, if I think of the food I've eaten today already, <laughs> the two meals I had, the whole global dimension was already on my table. I need not tell what it was. There was, for instance, a strawberry this lunch. I, I wondered why, where do strawberries come from at this time of the year when you have three meters of snow around you? <laughs> or fish from New Zealand we had tonight, <laughs> and so on. So the, the global dimension is in the commodities we eat with which we fulfill our basic needs every day. I'm wearing a, a jacket which comes from Thailand, so I'm not in, you see, and so forth. Uh, these commodities, or parts of them, are brought to us through the world market from faraway countries, regions, and climates, and also from different types of local production sites and producers. When we, as local consumers, buy these goods in the supermarket or somewhere else, the bananas from Central America, the tea from Assam, jeans from Sri Lanka, shampoo from Malaysia, a camera from the Philippines, we are not aware of this global dimension incorporated in these commodities. We know nothing of the product path of the T-shirt on our body, we may have, which may have cost only $2. We know nothing about the local effects which the production of the raw material may have caused for the environment. In this case, for instance, the cultivation of cotton for export. We do not know whether this cotton production destroyed the local food production, or how the, chem the chemicals used in cotton cultivation affected the soil and the water in that area. We also know nothing about the production condi conditions of those who have worked in the cotton fields, in the free trade zones in Sri Lanka, where these t-shirts are being sewn together or elsewhere. We do not care to know of their incomes. Uh, mostly women work in these uh, world market factories under very inhuman conditions. We do not know anything about their work and living conditions. All we are concerned with is usually the price of the commodity in front of our eyes. And yet, through this t-shirt, we are virtually connected globally to cotton growers, perhaps in India, to textile workers, perhaps in Australia, who cut the pieces, to women in the, free, uh, in the world market factories in Sri Lanka who sew the pieces together, to women in Papua New Guinea who add the label made in Papua New Guinea to the T-shirt, and to the women in Hong Kong who pack and send it abroad. So before that T-shirt reaches us, it has already traveled around half of the world, or perhaps the whole of the world. Today, most of our daily requirements come from this global supermarket. When we, as local consumers, consume, and that means when we eat up or destroy these commodities, we do not longer feel connected to the various places they come from. They do not bring us any message from those who have worked on, on them. They do not symbolize anything beyond themselves. They do not contain any trace of spirituality. A t-shirt is a t-shirt is a t-shirt. 
thus the modern global commodity market relates us de facto to the whole world, but this global relationship is not at all reflected in our local subjective consciousness. We are at the same time totally alienated from the faraway nature, the faraway people who produce this T-shirt or whatever else. The local and the global, though factually connected, are more connected perhaps than ever before, are at the same time more than ever separated. Like two entities who apparently have nothing to do with, with each other. So this is a very funny paradox. And I, that is why I said in the beginning, the local and the global are connected and at the same time divided. And this we have to keep in mind. Both relationships, this connection is there factually, materially, but subjectively there's nothing of that sort. And this is our problem. The reason for this lack of awareness about the global connections inherent in the commodities is not only the fact that production and consumption are so far apart, but also the violence towards living symbioses which form part and parcel of commodity production as such. Because without the violent destruction of these living symbioses, I call that in German the, the lebendigen Zusammenhang, which would perhaps be translated as the living relatedness or the living connectedness of, of all living things. Um, but one can also call it symbiosis. Uh, now, without destroying that, commodity production would not be possible. It is the same which we find in natural science, that matter has to be dissected into smaller and ever smaller bits and pieces and elements, and then these elements are being recombined. Similarly, in commodity production, uh, not the whole thing as it appears in nature is used, but it is taken out of its context, out of its living connectedness. And without that, it cannot be marketed. So and this is always a violent process. Immanuel Wallerstein has shown that the generalization of commodity production and consumption required a system that right from its beginning was a global world system. So this is the reason why we talk of globalism today, of global ecological destruction, etc. This globalization started with the beginning of capitalism as a global world system. And it required for its functioning the colonial division between its centers and their peripheries. Capitalist accumulation could not have happened without this globalization and this colonization. But it is a one-way street, this globalization. It meant the opening up of all countries, regions, climates, natural resources, even so-called human resources for the process of commodity production and profit making. But the benefits from these processes were not to be globally distributed. The industrialized countries in the North did not and do not want to open up their borders to the people from the South who just want to follow the wealth which has been taken away from their lands. The ongoing gut negotiations are just another example of this one-way globalization of the world market system. Uh, I have tried to show earlier that this one-sided globalization could not have been achieved without violence against women, violence against nature, and violence against other peoples. And it is this violent destruction of life and of subsistence which makes commodities so dead. Someone has said commodities are like corpses. This is also the reason why they do not satisfy us, why we never can say it is enough, it was good. They don't fill us, they don't satisfy us. Um, and it's also the reason why, do not rec why we do not recognize the connections incorporated in these commodities. <coughs> if we compare the goods from the global supermarket to those things which were produced and exchanged in a subsistence context, we realize that these things, necessary for the satisfaction of our fundamental needs, also contain a symbolic value, apart from their mere survival value. 
or put differently, survival is closely interwoven with and dependent on the maintenance of living related relationships, which are symbolized by the things we eat, the clothes we wear, and so forth. When we eat the vegetables which we have grown in our back uh, garden, we do not only consume calories, but while we, eating, while we eat them, we remember the work, the sun, the rain, the other people who helped us. Eating then is not just consumption, which also means destruction, but it is the re-enacting of our living relatedness to nature and to other people. And only this kind of eating seems to satisfy us. Or when instead of buying ever more new clothes, women uh, friends, that is for instance the Cuban Cologne who did that, they discussed these things and then they s decided why should we buy new clothes all the time? We could exchange clothes amongst each other. And that's what they did. Uh, these, and then these clothes which they wear, or they made clothes, and they exchanged other things. One woman liked making uh, clothes, the other woman had some other talent, and they exchanged this, and they called this whole uh, project an exchange of talents. So these clothes and pillowers or whatever they exchanged are not just something that kept the women warm, but they symbolize a relationship, they symbolize a friendship, and they would uh, have a different value than the money value. And I think this is what I mean as in contrast to the commodities which we buy. The global capitalist market, however, can function only when such living relationships rooted in subsistence and not commodified production are destroyed. Therefore, this global system is propagated and legitimized by the promise of a better life for all, by the promise to overcome the realm of necessity, as Hegel called it. And this means to uh, break the necessity which nature imposes on us and by establishing the realm of freedom by science, technology, industrialism, and never-ending growth of goods, services, and capital. The ecological crisis which we are facing today teaches, teaches us that this project of the Enlightenment, because that was the beginning of this great hope of overcoming necessity by science, technology, and economic growth, that this has come to an end. And I think that is what we have to reflect upon. Um, who uh, emphasize the connectedness of everything instead of these divisions and these dualisms. But also many of the spokespeople of the ecology movements in the South criticize this globalization discourse because it may amount to a new type of eco-colonialism. For instance, the industrialized countries of the North, instead of changing their lifestyles, their consumption and production patterns, expect expect from poor countries like Brazil or India that they should protect their rainforests, stop the profitable exploitation of their own resources, curb their population explosion. So this is a critique we hear, and rightly, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a correct critique, I think, that as long as the rich countries of the North are not prepared to reduce their standard of living, we have no right to tell anybody in the South to protect their rainforest, to, to uh, protect our climate, and so forth. Because we are the ones who cause the bulk of the destruction. Yes. Or other critics, for instance, like Wolfgang Sachs, ask why this discourse on globalization of ecological problems emerged at a particular time. Up to 72, when the Stockholm Conference on the Environment took place, ecological issues were considered local issues taken up by local movements. And most of the protesters drew their inspiration from basically human or vitalist philosophies. 
The international development establishment largely ignored these movements. But when this changed and a new conceptual framework emerged, and that was what was called the theory of ecosystems based on the systems theory and on cybernetics. This was used to put local incidents into a global framework. The globe, the earth, was now conceptualized as a closed ecosystem whose stability depended on the equilibrium of its component parts, namely resources, population, environment. And it was within this conceptual global framework that the Malthusian, Malthusian population theory, which so far had been used to explain the poverty in the South, was shifted to environmental issues. Population growth was seen as the main causal factor that disrupted the balance between resources on one hand and the environment on the other. The world was seen as a finite space which had reached its limits or its carry carrying capacity and further population increase would not be tolerable. So here we have one example that a new theory came out, came about, which has been used a lot by eco-feminists as well as by other ecologists to explain the global dimension of the um, ecological destruction. But if one looks at the theory as such, it is nothing new really. The system theory also is of the same character as the other machine type theories, consisting of component parts and uh, working along the same logic, basically. It does not consider the subjectivity of human beings because the system is sort of working as a machine works. There is no subject anymore. That means there is no responsibility anymore. And this is uh, why uh, Wolfgang Sachs criticizes this globalization based on the system theory and ecosystems theory. But when, once this system theory was formulated for ecological problems, it became accept acceptable to the ex establishment, both in the UN but also in other uh, parts, in, in the scientific community. So it, it appeared as being scientific. Whereas the earlier protests were more of another nature, more uh, of the humanistic types and people who simply said, no, we don't want this. <coughs> I think uh, f eco feminists or feminists particularly, uh, should be wary about this theory. Their critique of patriarchy and capitalism has not excluded a deeper <coughs> critique of modern science and its methodology. The paradigm of modern science is based on the machine model, and in this paradigm, not only the soul, the subject, feeling, love are eliminated, but what I call the whole living interconnectedness is dissected, disrupted, analyzed, and then recombined according to the machine model, as Carolyn Merchant has shown us. These are some uh, dimensions of the local global connection and disconnection. Uh, but now I would like to talk a little more also about the more positive aspects or the more positive potentialities which are also there in this relationship. Um, if we as feminists, or ecologists or people who are concerned about life on Earth really want to overcome these false dichotomies, we cannot simply turn this structure upside down and look for a solution only in the local situation and forget that meanwhile the multinationals continue to destroy the environment in their compulsion to, ach to achieve more growth. But if we ask those who have analyzed and studied the global situation for strategies which could overcome the crises, we just find more of the same. 
I've already said that all these big commissions and committees we were, which were set up, the Bundland Commission, the Club of Rome, the UN, they all propose more of the same. Even the Bundland Commission, with its emphasis on, on so-called sustainable development, says at the same time <coughs> that sustainable development can only be achieved by further growth. And this, of course, is nonsensical, because further growth is precisely the cause of ecological destruction. And they all follow the catching up development strategy, which I already criticized before. Uh, yeah, I will not go into what I said already, that this globalization of the living standard of the North would really be the end of uh, ecological life on Earth. But I said it is not even desirable, not even for those who have profited from it. We read daily about the increase of shelterlessness, of poverty, particularly of children and women in our big cities. We read of violence, of rising criminality and drug addiction, and other addictions. Depression and suicides are on the increase. So is violence against women and sexual abuse, abuse of children. It has been found that the quality of life in the USA is today lower than what it was 10 years ago. And there seems indeed to be an inverse relationship between the growth of the gross national product and the quality of life. Usually, uh, when people hear, like for instance in Germany, every year the figures about the GNP are being published, that this GNP has grown for about two or, I do not know, or one percent, people think that is a good, uh, good, that, that is good news. But I think we should begin to learn that that is bad news. I know what I'm saying here in Canada where you are um, just undergoing a, a period of recession, but I think it's time that we begin to think <coughs> deeply about these kind of standards and measurements of, of what a good life should be. So actually I say the more the, the gross national product grows, the more the quality of life deteriorates. And yet the growth of the gross national product is everywhere hailed as an indicator of good life. Uh, this growth model, however, not only entails immaterial social and psychic, psychological costs, with the growing deterioration of the ecological foundations even in the rich countries of the North, the affluent society increasingly becomes poor of the basic material necessities of life, namely of clean air, of unpoisoned water, of healthy food, of space, of sunshine which, which does not threaten us. That means in the midst of plenty of commodities, we, con we live in a state of want, and want of necessities. It's not just the things which are not necessary. Increasingly, we will feel that. And therefore, I say, this catching up uh, strategy is not even desirable for us. So it's not only impossible for those who haven't had this life, for ecological and economic reasons, but it's not even good for us. And we should think about giving it up. If we want to look for an alternative strategy to the catching up development strategy, we have to go to the women in the many grassroots movements against ecological destruction of their subsistence base. It is in these movements that we discover also the other positive dimension of the global in the local. By now, there exists a wealth of documentation which shows that women in the south, often rural women, but also women in the north, often simple housewives, are not only the most active in these movements, that they are sometimes the initiators of such movements, as for instance, the women, uh, the Chipko women in India who fought against the deforestation of the Himalaya ranges, or the women in the Green Belt movement in Kenya, or the women at Wiel, at a place in south east, southwest Germany, who protested against the construction of a nuclear power plant. So if we study these movements carefully, we ca discover that the women and not the men, the lay people and not the experts, 
the grassroots activists and not the scientists and politicians were the ones who were concerned about the global and the long-term perspective, about the general, and not only about their local interests. They were aware of the interconnectedness of everything with everything, and they combined their local struggle with a concern for the whole and the resistance against capitalist patriarchy. For instance, when after the meltdown at Three Mile Island in the USA, women came together for the first eco-feminist conference in March 1980, a conference called Women and Life on Earth. Inestra King, one of the organizers, wrote about this interconnectedness. Eco-feminism is about connectedness and wholeness of theory and practice. It asserts the special strength and integrity of every, thi every living thing. For us, the snail data is to be considered side by side with the community's need for water, the porpoise side by side with appetite for tuna, and the creatures it might fall on over Skylab. We see the devastation of the Earth and her beings by the corporate warriors as a threat of nuclear annihilation by the military warriors as feminist concerns. It is a masculinist mentality which would deny us our right to our own bodies and sexuality, and which depends on multiple systems of dominance and state power to have its way. In Germany, when we had the, in around 1983, when the peace movement fought against the installation of nuclear missiles in Germany, the feminists had a slogan, peace, in patriarchy means war against women. And we try to connect all the time the violence against women, which is an everyday affair, with the violence of the war machine we are fighting against. And whenever, wherever women have started or acted against ecological destruction or the threat of nuclear annihilation and pollution, uh, they saw immediately this connection between patriarchal violence against women, violence against other nations, and violence against nature. Patriarchy was identified as a system that combines hatred of women and hatred of nature. Out of this understanding grew a concern for global well-being. Uh, I quote again Inestra King, who said, in defying this patriarchy, we are loyal to future generations and to life on this planet itself. We have a deep and particular experience as women. And this um, aggression of the corporate and military warriors against the environment was almost physically felt as an aggression of our female body. Uh, thus, for instance, the women in Switzerland who mobilized against the poisoning at Seveso by a Swiss multinational firm wrote, we should think of controlling our bodies in a more global way, as it is not only men and doctors who behave aggressively towards our bodies, but also the multinationals. What more aggression against the body of women, against the children than that of La roche qui at Seveso? From 10th July 1976, their entire lives have been taken over by the accident and the effects are going to last for a long time. Women in Sicily who fought against the stationing of nuclear missiles expressed this in a similar vein. And after Chernobyl, there was a big uh, mobilization among women in many parts of the world. In Germany, women went into the streets and for made, uh, formed uh, new groups called Women Against Atomic Energy. Even in Russia, I found a quote of women, uh, uh, of women who said, men uh, always think of conquering the enemy and nature. They never think of life. So even in Russia, the women were aware of this connection. Or in Japan, women went into the streets and fought against nuclear energy. So it was understood that, new, that this division, this artificial division between nuclear energy for missiles and nuclear energy for home consumption is nonsensical. It could not be maintained. It is war technology in all cases and always. And that is why we rejected it outright.
But not only women in the industrialized countries realize this connectedness, also women in the third world realize this connectedness between the local and the global. Um, particularly women who are engaged in struggles for survival, dignity, and the preservation of their independent subsistence base. I mentioned already the women in the Chipko movement in India, or uh, there are women like Meda Patak, who became a leader of the movement of poor people against the construction of big dams on the Narmada River, a project sponsored by the World Bank in India. The concern of these women to conserve their independent subsistence uh, is not to be developed. And that is very important that we understand it. They reject development outright. They want to preserve their environment, their independent base of subsistence, because they know that if a dam is built, or if a whole series of dams is supposed to be built on the Narmada to create electricity, and also irrigation, it is said, that the poor tribal people who have to be driven out from their villages, which have to be flooded, that they will never be the beneficiaries of this so-called development. And I think this is one of the reasons why, particularly the women in the third world, are much more clear-sighted about the long-term effects. And this was very clearly spe spelled out also by the women in the Chipko movement, who said at one stage when some of the men said, but uh, we could also have sawmills and small factories at the foot of the hills, and then the men would find uh, jobs. Hmm? But the women said, nothing doing. Even if you have sawmills and small factories at the foot of the hills, we women do not know whether we, whether we would get any money from the men, or whether they would drink it away. Huh? And what would happen to these factories and these sawmills when the trees have gone? So they had the long-term perspective. And they were against cutting down the trees. And they said, as long as we have and preserve these forests and the land, we will have water. Our animals will have fodder. We will have uh, energy, because that's what they also used. And we will collaborate with Mother Earth with Bhumi Mata, as they call her. Uh, and this is our freedom, and this is our dignity. In one of the cases which Vandana Shiva quotes in her writings is that uh, the, it was a, another instance of such a resistance movement where the uh, entrepreneurs tried to break the resistance of the people by bribing the young men. They offered them motorbikes, they offered them money, they offered them jobs. And in one case, uh, the son of one of the women leaders said, I cannot sell the honor of my mother for any money. And then the women said, we do not need any jobs from anybody. As long as we have our land here, we don't need jobs from the state or from anybody. We have enough here. And this is a totally different perspective than what we are used to, and a totally different concept of freedom, of dignity, because all our concepts of freedom, of dignity, depend on money, and not on our creative and productive interaction with Mother Earth, which these women still had. And I think the majority of women in the North don't have this relationship anymore. But uh, I think this is a very important, for me this was a very important um, lesson I learned from studying the grassroots movements of women in the third world who cannot have the illusion that this development eventually will also be for them. They know that they are only the ones who pay the costs, who pay the price, and the others will reap the benefits. The people living in the city of Bombay or Baroda uh, who get the electricity and so forth. But the others have to pay the price. That means in these local struggles, not only the global or the universal X aspects are seen and respected, and I think they are more clearly seen, the universal truth that we all depend on Mother Earth, and that uh, food does not come out of the supermarket, 
but eventually it comes out of this earth. Hmm? But this simple and trivial truth is forgotten by most of us already, but they still remember this universal truth. And I would add another one, which is also very much present in the minds of these women, that human beings come out of women, and that this is not population just like that. So these are two universal global truths which we should not forget, that it's women who they give birth to people, and that life comes eventually out of this earth. And that is the same in India, and it is the same here, it's the same in Germany or wherever we go. And this is also a base for a new global dimension or a new, whether you want to call it internationalism or universalism, I don't, that's not the point here, but I think there is a commonness, an understanding that we have something in common. And I think in this respect, we can learn most from the women who fight for the, for, to maintain the autonomy over this kind of survival base. It's not just the autonomy over our own body only, because we cannot maintain this autonomy if we are totally dependent on the multinationals, for instance, to, to give us safe contraceptive pills, to have children or not to have children. I mean, if what, what autonomy is this? And it's the same thing with, our, with regard to the food we have. If we are totally dependent on the world market to eat, hmm, then we cannot speak any longer of autonomy. Yeah, and the last point, um, I want to, or the last dimension of this relationship between the global and the local is uh, what, can, what does this mean now for our everyday life? I think the global is in the local in our everyday life also. And if we want to get out of this destructive relationship which so far exists, we have to start where we are, are in our everyday life and to rediscover the global in the local in this everyday life and change our lifestyle. And this would be my proposition for a strategy or for action which we could take. Many people, many women and men who have participated in ecological movements saw the immediate connection between their own wasteful lifestyle and the environmental destruction. And they began to change this lifestyle. For instance, the women in the anti-atomic movement in Germany told me that for them the consumer model preached by industry and the media was no longer acceptable. That they had begun to change their consumption pattern, that they would think about what and how much they buy and that they would again try to grow vegetables in their gardens and depend more on what they themselves could produce. They saw clearly that a drastic reduction in the consumption of goods was necessary, was a necessary consequence if they were against atomic energy. Because very often the politicians and the scientists uh, pretend that they can find technological solutions or technological fixes to these problems which would enable us to continue with the same lifestyle. Hmm? Particularly after Chernobyl, this was often said, even by the people of the Green Party in Germany, that um, if we could ha have other sources of energy, like for instance solar energy. Uh, we could have the same things which we have now. But if one really thinks deeply about all these things, it is impossible. Because these are all high-tech inventions which need a lot of material and uh, will not be just for nothing. There is no inexhaustible source of energy. I think it's better that we realize this. And that means we have to recognize that there are limits uh, which we have to respect through our everyday behavior. Uh, many people have begun to put these insights into practice. Many people have given up their cars, have reduced their consumption, have saved energy, and so forth. But these efforts, I consider them very important because everything has to start with individuals. But what is needed is a much broader 
consumer liberation movement, and I deliberately call it a consumer liberation movement, and particularly also for women. A, woman, a, a movement which translates into everyday practice what we believe in and what we have understood. And it should mobilize more people than is happening at present. Because only if considerable numbers of people say that they no longer want this wasteful and destructive lifestyle, only then the politicians, the scientists, and the industrialists will finally realize that they have to change something, that their growth model has come to an end. Because we cannot, as consumers, only say that the others have the power, that, that we are helpless victims in this. We have power, and I think we all know that, and women have particularly power also in this respect, which we have not yet used politically enough. There have been uh, very good movements already, but I think we could think about how to broaden such movements and to um, link up with other such movements so that uh, we bring about a change in lifestyle and in thinking. And this can happen only, I think, if we at the same time create what I had called this living interconnectedness. It is not enough that we do it alone. While we, for instance, um, or I would put it other, another way, the women in Cologne who started thinking about what they, uh, what they buy and whether they could not satisfy their own needs by exchanging things, created at the same time new social relations among themselves. Or for instance, another example, when my washing machine broke down, I didn't buy a new one, but I asked my neighbor whether I could use hers, and I paid the part which was uh, hers, and now we both use the washing machine together. And uh, by doing this, I have, we have created a relationship, and a good neighborly relationship. And uh, after the Gulf War, de we decided we will have a meal together once a week. Huh? So like that also, for the necessary things, it's not friendships or relationships among people. Uh, are no longer based on family ties, I think. We can recreate new types of relationships based on the satisfaction of our necessary daily requirements. And if we do that, then these relationships also will have a different character. They will be necessary. For instance, I cannot afford to to fight with my neighbor unnecessarily because I need the washing machine. <laughs> and formerly, I think these types of relationships kept village communities intact or family, families intact. But we have thought that freedom consists of being independent of all such necessary relationships. And the commodity market has helped us to isolate ourselves and to get atomized, totally. So every individual now has everything herself, himself, and that we don't need people anymore. And the result is we all feel lonely. You know? We sit as social atoms in our little, uh, yeah, in our houses or whatever, and apparently we don't need, but we do need people, and we are not happy without people. And I think within, uh, an ecological or eco-feminist movement, we could use our feminist networks very well in a much more efficient way if we would translate into practice these kind of things, if we would use these uh, networks we have, local ones, and they need not only be local ones, they could even be international ones, where we relate to each other not just by a kind of luxury relationship, uh, which uh, can be mobilized uh, when we feel like, and it can be forgotten when we don't feel like, but in a much more uh, concrete and necessary way, so that we relate to each other uh, about things we really need. And that would amount to, uh, that, and here I will end then, that we would tendentially try to satisfy our basic needs by non-commodified ways and forms. And this would then really be, um, or would eventually 
lead to what we call a new subsistence economy or a new subsistence perspective, where we would, we would not be able, of course, totally to opt out of the economy in which we are now, but we would have a different value system. And uh, things would not be valuable because they have cost so and so much, but because we have exchanged them or because they relate us to others, to other people with whom we share certain ideals, certain goals. So this then also would be an instance of the global in the local and vice versa, the local in the global. So that's all I want to say. and before we go down to the first floor to the art gallery to join her for a reception, she has, Professor Meese has agreed to consider questions. If you choose not to use the microphone on the stairwell, will you please speak up very loudly? Of the type of the Chipko movements, for instance, who explicitly said that they do not want development. I only know of one movement in Ladakh, in uh, northwest India, where the people also, uh, for instance, have made a protest movement against tourism. No, I know of another one in Goa also, because it said, we do not want this kind of development. Leave us alone. And I think in many parts of the third world, it's not only women who do this, but uh, women particularly in areas where they have been made responsible for the survival or the subsistence, where the men have migrated already to a large extent. They are the ones who are more aware of this connection and they are more disillusioned and critical of the development paradigm or the development model. I know some more examples in, uh, for instance, in Germany, a group of people who started already in the students' movement, uh, they are trying out uh, to sort of rebuild a kind of subsistence perspective. And they start by the waste production of our industrial society. They make compost out of the organic waste and they have made contracts with various townships already uh, to get this uh, organic waste first. Uh, it should not be destroyed because it's living matter and it should go back to the earth. And they have shared this same, they actually learned a lot from the women in the Himalayas and also from Ladakh. And they tried to put that into practice in Cologne. Hmm? So when they had made their first compost, they thought, well, compost belongs to where it comes from, it belongs to the earth. So they managed to get land, and they were all city people originally, and uh, now they have land, and they try to experiment with ecological farming. This is a mixed group. There are several other examples, but it's not only women. That's correct, yeah. In fact, I would say that uh, increasingly, there are men who get interested in this kind of approach and see the futility of the old growth industry or growth economy.
-huh. And they formed a, a collective, as it were, a cooperative contract with about 10 different families. And the first year, the harvest was so large that they sold the remaining produce yeah. at market price because there was so much harvest that everybody got their share back. Everybody got back what they put in, and then there was an excess. Yeah. The following year, they bought another section of land and increased once again the amount of food produced and included more families in the collective. Yeah. So it is, it's entirely possible from a very local level yes. in your own backyard to exactly. do this kind of work between men and women yep. in, in terms of retrieving your resources. Exactly. And it's often possible even to do it on the ruins of capitalism or the ruins which capitalism leaves behind. I read recently that book uh, published in, by Irene Diamond uh, on ecofeminism. There's a beautiful example of an old woman in uh, Philadelphia who asked the uh, municipality to use some land which was waste uh, to make gardens. And she started gardening in the middle of, and soon the chi she, she collected the children around, the youngsters who were only uh, in for drugs and violence, and they got interested in gardening. And they planted uh, all sorts of vegetables. And these uh, young kids, they respected these gardens. They protected them. It were their gardens. So what is interesting in, in these kind of projects, they solve a whole series of problems, not only one. And that is what we should uh, aspire to. It is unemployment is being solved. Uh, crime is being solved, violence is being solved to a large extent, if the men particularly are getting interested in this kind of subsistence work, they will have less time and less interest in violence. I think it's absolutely necessary. If we want to do something against violence, we have to involve men in this kind of life-preserving uh, work, whether it's ecological work, looking after children, looking after the sick, looking after old people, etc. All what housewives so far have been doing. And, but it's very interesting and I'm very happy that you are telling these examples. I think we should try to collect them, to collect such and document such examples to show that it is possible. Because if one talks about it like that, people say, oh, this is utopian, it's not possible. But it's happening already. whether it will follow. It will definitely not follow automatically unless we want it. But it is true. It would, be a, a, it would revolutionize this capitalist, colonial, patriarchal system. Definitely. And I think uh, in when we, myself, it's, of course, my friends, this is not an idea which only grew out of my head. Um, and my friends, when we think about the subsistence perspective, if that's how we call it, as an alternative to the capitalist, patriarchal, colonial mode, uh, then we also think that, oh, that um, this is something which could not be captured or co-opted again by capitalism. Because when capitalism, or already when it started, it had to draw people away from subsistence. And it did that always violently. In our countries, uh, the peasants were not running to the factories. Uh. I mean, the old subsistence space first had to be destroyed. The same happened in the colonies. And the World Bank made it very explicit. And they said, the aim is to draw peasants away from subsistence. So as long as people, like the Chipko women, can, can say, we don't need any jobs. No, we, we produce our life together with Mother Earth here. Huh? You can't have capitalism. Now, of course, when we say subsistence as a perspective, would not perhaps mean the old subsistence anymore. We have to think about what it can be.
but it is definitely, it would be different relationships and a different value system and it would revolutionize everything and that will not happen and a different definition of what good life means. And good life would no longer mean a wealth of commodities, but it would mean good relations, happy relations, and joy of life. And that we have to recreate out of our, yeah, out of ourselves. <laughs> Exactly, Mother yeah. Earth, and the white man supposedly is, is in conflict. Yes. And they're always trying to control the power that they're trying to establish through money. Yes, exactly. I can just tell you, uh, two weeks ago I was in Sweden at a conference, at a feminist conference. There was a woman from the Sami community, the Laps, and she told us that the Norwegian state is now trying to destroy the culture of these people who live on this reindeer, uh, the, the reindeer economy, and uh, they had made links with other tribal women, also with Canadian ones, and they have a conference and they have created an international network of indigenous women. And their main aim is to fight the market economy. I was very, very surprised that they bring women together from the the, tri the tribes from uh, the rainforest, women from Canada, from Mexico, and totally different cultures, and yet they have something in common. And one thing was the deep feeling about the relationship to the earth, their culture, huh? and this kind of, we want to preserve our autonomous way of living here. We don't want to be developed. We don't want to be modernized. It was very, I had never heard about such a network, but it exists. Thank you for your questions. It is, of course, a most pleasant duty to thank Mariah Meese for her lecture this evening. It's especially gratifying to have attended to a feminist analysis of international themes by a scholar internationally published and renowned so near to International Women's Day. And by the by, Clara Zetkin, the feminist Marxist who led women to found in International Women's Day in 1908, originated too from Germany. <laughs> yes. Originated but moved beyond boundaries to resist economic systems and male supremacy. We know that countless women have dedicated their hearts and minds to the problems of women's global oppression since 1908. Ding Ling, for instance, the Chinese feminist, wrote in 1942, 50 years ago, an essay called Thoughts on March 8th, International Women's Day. This essay got her into a good deal of trouble with her male comrades, of course. Ding Ling asks in this piece, when will it no longer be necessary to attach special weight to the word woman and raise it specially? The intellectual work and activism of Mariah Meese, which engages us so, is one expression of our hope that Ding Ling's question, the question of all feminists, will be answered with a transformation of global and social and economic relations and sooner rather than later. Dr. Mies has made it clear this evening the urgent need for change. We ask now that Mariah Mies please accept our thanks and accept this gift from us. and I really don't understand and know why uh, this was so, um, so, so important for you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much indeed. I'm glad I came. <laughs>
Yes, well, everyone, please, if they can, join us in the art gallery for a reception and to meet Dr. Meese.